When some people build a model, they want it to look brand new, nice and shiny. Or if they've got a new uh, piece of equipment for the railroad, they like it to be nice and shiny. I like stuff to look old and beat up. So that's what we're going to be doing here, is we're going to be learning how to take new materials and make it look old. We're going to begin with this little 143rd scale uh, kit put out by AMT years ago. It's a 36 Ford. We're going to give it an overspray with a basic rust color. I've chosen American Accents. This is readily available. And we just lightly spray it on. Now you'll notice I'm not covering the underside of this car completely, but rather I'm just putting on a light mist coat. What I do is I let this dry and come back and add others later. Here you can see how far away I'm shooting the paint. I don't do it in close. Again, we're not trying to get a smooth coat, but we're just trying to get that paint when it hits the surface to be almost dry. Another coat I'm putting on top of it is Tamaya. This is red-brown, another basic rust color. And I just alternate coats between the Tamaya red-brown and the, the terracotta. And uh, let these dry. In between each coat, I give it about 10 or 15 minutes before I spray it again. Again, doing it from a distance, just trying to let that settle on there. Here's a little bit of the red-brown. Just want it to have actually a, a texture, a, a toothy kind of texture that we can actually uh, touch and feel. And here's our finished car. Just a, a very basic rust color, nothing specific. Uh, uh, just we're going to paint over it. Now, what I'm pointing at here is some salt. This is ordinary table salt, but I've crunched it up. And I'm going to lick the side of the car right there on that door. I'm licking it now. And then I quickly, while that saliva is still wet, I sprinkle some of that salt on the side of the door. It's going to represent areas where there's either chips or where the, the paint has bubbled up from the weather. After the saliva is dried and everything, you can see the bits of salt right there on the door. Now, if you have more salt on there than what you want, and I have that here, just take your finger and just lightly rub it like that and the extra just falls right off so that way you can leave just the amount of salt on there that you want to have on there to represent represent the the blistered and bubbled paint where the paints have uh, chipped off now i've added a a coat of creamy yellow but before i did this i put four or five coats of dull coat on i put the dull coat on let each coat dry and i let that set for about five days then I put this uh, light creamy color paint on there. Now you see what I'm doing there? I've got an X-Acto knife and a paintbrush. What we're going to do is we're going to put some scratches alongside the door of this car. And I'm not doing it freehand, but I'm doing it and I'm using the back side of the blade of the X-Acto blade. And you'll notice what I do is I actually move the car, not the blade, but I push the car along. What that does is that allows me very good control and it makes sure that those marks are exactly horizontal, just like a car mark would be on a door if it hit a mailbox or something like that. The amount of scratches you want to put here depends upon the amount of abuse you want to show, of course. I'm doing it just so that there's enough there to, that you can really see what's going on. And so it shows through. If you rotate the blade, then you can actually scratch lower on the same car without a lot of changes. See how that automatically puts it down at the bottom for scratching it lower? So you can have one scratch or you can have several. Very easy little technique to do. And since we put the, the dull coat on and let it dry thoroughly before, before we put this color coat on, then it leaves this very thin color coat. Now this color coat is dried for about 20 minutes. There I've just rubbed off the extra little bits of paint that were peeled up by the scraping surface. Now over on the other side, this is where we had the salt. You can see there's a rough texture there. We'll go in closer on that so that we can see what it actually looks like. Okay, now I'm taking some masking tape, just peeling a 
piece off and making a little circle that I can use. Now we're going in close and we're going to actually use this to pull that top coat of that fresh paint off. Sort of hard to see exactly from this far away, so when we go in closer you will be able to see it quite a bit better. But this is so you see the principle that is involved. Just work it around, do it to the amount you want. And there you can see you've got great blistered paint. It's even discolored around the, the edges of the blisters. And there's the scratches. Now if you want more scratches, you can use a larger object. Here I'm using a small file. And I'm going to put a, a really deep gouge in there. Just really deep. Change it from a minor scratch to a deep gouge. And you get that variety there. And it just really adds a nice finish to it. You can use this on any surface, but it's important that you don't do this freehand, but rather prop it on something so that your lines are exactly parallel with the ground. Now on these old cars in the back, that rumble seat up there, people would reach into that rumble seat or and that area that I'm pointing at right there, well the paint would wear thin very quickly there. So to show that, what we're taking here is I've got a a piece of cloth, a clean piece of cloth, and I'm just using ordinary testers uh, liquid cement. It's methyl ethyl ketone but uh, it's just a cheap, convenient way to, to use it. Now that paint again has been dry about 25 minutes now, so I'm just putting that methyl ethyl ketone right on there, and what it does is it softens that top layer of fresh paint, and you can see it just lifts right off, just that easily. Just use a, a rocking motion, don't scrub, use a petting motion or a rocking motion, and it very quickly comes off just that easy to do, just like that. Now one thing you'll notice when you look at that, is you're going to see there's a little bit of a faint stripe pattern there, and that's because the particular cloth that I used had uh, a weave to it, a texture, so that that texture shows up. So be sure to get a smooth finish cloth. The best type to use really is, a, is an old t-shirt. Now we can go ahead and we can use that similar technique on different parts. Now on the side of the hood of the car there'd be a lot of wear in these old cars. These old cars had a reddish primer underneath and that reddish primer very quickly got worn down to paints in the old days are just not like the paints today. Today's paints are a big improvement to the ones uh, of years ago, back in the 30s. Now here you can see I'm just continuing to pat and apply this material. It just softens the paint, allows it to be absorbed into the, the washcloth very easily, or the t-shirt, whatever you're using. Very easily done. Uh, a very nice technique and uh, one that has a lot of applications. And the more you use it, the, the more you'll enjoy it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take another part of the car, another section. We're going to remove paint there and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a small paintbrush and I've gone into my tester's liquid cement and I'm just flowing that, s that paint, that liquid cement, right onto the paint surface itself. And this barely touching it, I'm able to lift it and move it and to get it to flow around. See how easily that softens and loosens that and just brings out that rust color from underneath? Very easily done. Very easy to control with a small brush. Very effective way of doing this. Gives a, a nice appearance there. Get a little more. Now this area up on top, this was generally canvas on the original cars. I had a friend with a 36 Ford like that, and it was definitely canvas. Uh, but I just wanted to have a nice flat area there just to play with this and let you see how it's done, see how it just moves around and how you can uh, really affect the colors. Now, I've used a, a light uh, beige cream yellow here, but you can use any color, and it will work fine for this. This... Uh, light color just allows a, a good contrast. You can just uh, continue on any part of the car where 
think it's been out in the sun. Now, a secret in weathering, of course, is always to stop uh, when you think you've done enough. Don't uh, get too carried away with your weathering. Uh, a lot of people go overboard on it. When I first started weathering, I certainly went overboard. A lot of people still think I go overboard. Uh, I just like uh, old-looking stuff. But it's much easier to stop than it is to go back and to put the paint on again and start your efforts all over again. Again, just right along here at the bottom, that's an area where there would be a running board there on these old cars, and water would build up there, and that's an area that they would certainly rust out pretty quick, be right along the bottom of that door. It's important to take your time while doing something like this on a model. Uh, a particular little thing like this uh, doesn't really take all that much time. We're at our actual time working on this about probably 15 minutes altogether. And so it's not a tremendous amount of time, but it certainly makes for a distinctive uh, piece of equipment to have uh, some place on a layout or as a highlight of a diorama. And this is something can be done in any scale. It's just as effective in 1 24th scale as it is in O scale or even in HO scale. You can use this same effect. You get the same effect one way or the other. So I'm just continuing to look at other areas there to where the paint may have worn off. See, I'm able to take even that area where that scratch was and, and do this like if I got too many scratches on or if I want a combination of the scratch and just the general peeled area, I can do this. One thing you can do after you brush this if you want, you can go back over this with a soft piece of cloth like a t-shirt and actually lift a little bit more paint off if that's what you want to do. And I'm going to rust out the bottom along the side of this door again too. Just lightly scrubbing. You may notice that the paintbrush is actually picking up some of that color. If you want on some of these things, you can actually put a little bit of paint into your cement so that as you're applying this, you can be adding a, another little coat, maybe a, a, a dirt color or a light brown, something like that, just as a way of blending the paints a little more right on uh, the item that you're weathering. There's our bubbled side. Nice clear shot of it. Pretty easily done. Now here I'm putting a, a coat of uh, paint, probably putting on uh, some dull coat. I'm going to be working with the fenders. Here in the background you see I've got uh, some paint. I've got uh, little bottles of testers, that's uh, a roof brown color, and the other is their rust color. And what we're going to do is we're just going to be applying these uh, in areas uh, on the model where uh, I want a little extra detail as far as rust goes. I mix my paints in the caps of the bottle. Rarely do I stick a paintbrush down into uh, uh, a bottle full of paint. When you shake a bottle, uh, there's a plenty of paint there in the cap for virtually all of our uses. And what I actually do is I take my paintbrush and go back and forth between the, the roof brown and the rust and actually end up mixing the two in the cap of the paint. Now here I have a little grinding device. I have different ones of these. I've got several different gr Dremel tools for different things and this one is actually an engraving device and it's a very small unit but I've got my smallest bit in it. What I want to be doing is reaching up inside this fender well and I'm going to be grinding. You can see how tiny that little bit is. Now you can do this with a Dremel tool. And I'm just trying to make that fender working from the inside. I'm trying to make it almost as thin as paper. Just absolutely as thin as I can get it. Now I'm showing this in actual time rather than editing it down to s save a few seconds of film. I'm doing it this way just so you can see how much time I actually invest on working on the inside of this fender. I'm going to invest uh, a few minutes here. Again, this actually goes pretty quick, and 
what we're going to do is we're going to show this fender is being rusted to the point that the rust is eaten all the way through the fender. Having worked on the inside, now I switch to the outside and just trim it a little bit. And I'm actually pulling from inside, working my way back and forth, and I'm actually going to pull that towards the view until it pops through. See that little bit of yellow right there? That's what I'm shooting for, is I'm just barely touching that plastic. I just barely want to eat through that. Be very careful here doing this, or you can get carried away and just chew up the whole thing. But what I'm trying to get is just little holes. Clean it up a little bit from the outside to smooth it down. Very easy thing to do, but you have to be very careful when doing this. This is certainly an area in which you don't want to hurry. Just a little bit of extra patience and delicate things like this can make a big difference. This is a type of uh, piece that you can certainly put right at the very front of your layout uh, so people can see uh, this rust work and everything. And when it's all done, it looks uh, very nice. But it's very straightforward, very easy to do. You just have to be very careful while working on it. Never do be too careful while doing these things. Now I take an emery board and I'm just cleaning it up. There's always little spurs, little bits of plastic sticking up. So I'm just knocking down those pieces of plastic to smooth it out. There's a little bit of a chunk out of that fender down. There's even one place in which it has eaten through. Uh, there's just a little circle there where it's eaten through completely. Sort of hard to tell from uh, the video just how that's been done. Now here I also like to paint on the caps of things. Here I've got a little bit of uh, metallic steel, a little bit of the dark rust color, and a little bit of that roof brown, all testers colors. Very small amount there, very small paintbrush. This is a pretty stiff brush. And what I'm doing is I'm not painting in strokes. You'll notice that, that what I'm actually doing is getting tiny bits of paint and I poke at it. See how I'm just poking at it and touching it to it? This way you add little bits and pieces of color and that's when you look at rust. Rust is not a, a real smooth thing. There's a lot of texture to it. By working at it carefully and, and just poking at it and building it up, it adds to that roughness and, and that texture something that's awfully hard to actually see but it's there and your your eye knows it's there and it helps to make things look more realistic when it's done that way. Just continuing to add a little bit more. What we're going to do is we're actually going to paint over this area again with the uh, cream colored yellow and we're just going to have this area show through. Now this is some powdered chalk available from Bragdon Enterprises. And I use just the tiniest amount. You can see I'm just using the tip of the X-Acto blade there, getting tiny amounts of this, putting it into place on the fender. I'm tapping it in a little bit, pressing in a little bit with it, just trying to affix it there. I want it to look very, very, very fragile, just barely on there. Now what you can do here, I've taken a paintbrush and I've put it in thinner and now I'm reaching in and getting some of that rust and sort of painting it on there just to show you as another way of putting it on. This puts it on a little a little more smoothly so you can cover a wider area. There I'm just hitting it to knock off the, the loose pieces. Be careful when you use this powder. It's very easy to make a huge mess with this. It's very fun stuff to work with. A lot of uses for it but the kind of powder it is, if you get it into your clothes or into your carpet, it's not going to come out. So there we've got that general brighter color of rust. And that's what we're after there, is that brighter color of rust. Now over on the other side of the fender, I want to also add a little bit of rust color here. Again, this is areas we're going to spray over this later, but I want to be able to bring out that rust effect in these particular areas here because we're going to be removing some of that color. So just putting a, a liberal dose of 
the rust on there and just patting around. Just keep adding it till you, you think it looks like a rusty fender would look. Okay, and then when you get to the point where you're satisfied with it, well, you need to stop. It's easy to keep doing too much. Now here again, I've come back with a paintbrush with a little bit of thinner on it just to seat that, make that adhere just a little bit better. That thinner sort of softens the paint and allows this rust material, this chalk material to adhere better. So we don't want it falling off in our next step. So here I'm just adding a little bit more powder shaking off the excess and you can see that it has a nice rusty look to it. Now here I've got a soldering iron. It's hot. I've got it propped up against a piece of wood. I've got a hammer holding the back of it down and a pair of pliers in hand. And what I'm doing is I'm sticking the tip of that hot soldering iron right up inside this rear fender on this car have to be very careful while doing this. You have to heat it enough to allow you to bend it with the pliers, but you don't want to heat it so much that it melts and sags. Just sort of hard to, to know exactly how long this takes, and what you have to do is you have to try it and play with it a little bit. Now this is a pretty large soldering iron. I think this is a 40 watt soldering iron. So it puts out quite a bit of heat. And there you can see I was able to easily bend that and flare that that fender out. What we're trying to do is we're trying to look like it's been wrinkled in an accident and uh, the guy has tried to straighten it out but hasn't got it back to its usual shape so it's still bent and everything and there's some wrinkles in there that are just going to be in there. Again using heat very carefully bending it carefully, bending it back and forth. I bend it one way one time and then I bend it the next time so then instead of just getting a 90 degree bend you actually get a crinkle effect in there. Uh, and that's how you've seen fenders that get wrecked. They, they go in all kinds of distorted ways. Some Sometimes they just bend and sometimes they're worse. Metal back in the old days was a lot heavier than it is today. This was a much thicker type of steel than what you find in cars today. Cars were a lot heavier back then and it, it didn't bend quite as much but you know it didn't take much force to bend it very much. We just keep working it out until we're satisfied with it. And again when you get it to the right point stop and, and do something else. So here you can see a close-up of that and you can see that I've got it bent in everything and not badly bent, but enough that uh, you can see there's been some injury to it. Now what I'm going to do next, is I'm going to actually take the soldering iron and actually touch it to the plastic over on the other fender. And this just melts it away. Now this is one of those things that it's sort of hard to control because it just melts it very quickly so you just want to touch it and pull away, touch it and pull away, touch it and pull away. And it's another way of getting a, a damaged effect. Now you can use this on the inside of a piece of rolling stock like a hopper. Uh, and just heat up in the inside and press on the outside uh, with a screwdriver or something like that. Now this is rubber cement, ordinary rubber cement. I put it on a piece of paper and using a toothpick I apply it right in those areas where I want the paint to be pulled away from the rusted areas. I want to put this on very carefully. Don't go overboard with this. You don't want the whole thing done this way. I do it on just small parts of the fenders right where the paint would be likely to have flaked off over the years. This old paint didn't hold up very well. Now there I've gone and I've sprayed uh, a couple of coats of a dull coat on here. And then I let that dry for a long time and then I've put this cream coat on that's dried again about 20 minutes. And there with that piece of masking tape I just touch it to those areas and you see how easily it pulls that latter coater, that light coat of paint off and reveals those rusted areas underneath very easily done. Back here in the back I'm not going to uh,
do that. I didn't put any rubber cement back here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of my tester cement and apply it right where this wrinkle is. I'm going to let that set there for just a second. Then I'm going to take a paintbrush and I'm just going to brush across the surface like that. This removes it from the highlights. You can stop at any point you want or you can keep on going and reveal as much rust underneath as you want to do. But areas like this where there was a wrinkle, there would always be a lot of rust developed because the rust would spread under that paint. It's very important when you talk in terms of weathering that you go out and actually look at rusted cars. Uh, anytime you see rusty things, go and look at it, see how the rust accumulates, see how the paint wears away. Now here on this fender, I'm painting some of the uh, thinner directly on and just to remove some of the paint a very small amount here I'm coming back with that piece of cloth again just touching it and lifting it just soaks right into that cloth and you can take off just a small amount again stop before you get carried away with this because you do it too much it, it doesn't look right and what we're demonstrating here is not a finished model but we're just demonstrating the techniques so that you can see how easy it is to use these common materials that you have around and just use them in a way that uh, you may not have used them before in order to, to make something look uh, realistic. Very nicely done on that fender. Uh, subtle. There's enough there to show there's quite a bit of wear. Now in this area where we have all this chip come off, I pulled off a little more paint than what I really wanted to do. So what I want to do, I'm going back right in the area where the uh, we had worn it away with a little tool. There it sort of clung a bit, so I'm just removing that yellow paint there so that you can see uh, how that is worn right through there. Then in areas like here, I'm just going to soften this a little bit. I'm going to just soften that paint and move it around a little bit to soften that area so it's not quite as sharp a line down on this part just carry that rust right on down to the side. Very easy technique to use. Just tap it a little bit to uh, lift away some of the paint. Do it till it looks right to you. Now here I've got some chalks, a different kind of chalks. These are ones I bought probably 25 years ago, a set of chalks, and I've still got the complete set here now. It works uh, very well. And we're just going to take some of this and we're going to rub some of this chalk off onto a piece of paper. This gives you a nice small amount of chalk to work with. Of course, if you want more, you can take a stick of the chalk and just scrape some off. I like this particular bright color. It looks good as a rust, but all the other colors in the package are helpful too. So here we have our fender again. Just dabbing on a little bit of this rust. Just putting on a light amount of it, just barely on top. Bring out the rusty effect of that fender. It doesn't stick very well. So what you may want to do is what I'm doing here is actually taking a brush with some thinner in it. This is not the liquid cement, but the thinner and brushing it and actually picking up some of the powder with it and putting it on. It's not quite as crisp and shiny but uh, it does a very good job. And you can put as much or as little on of this as you want, of course. Just adding a little bit more, trying to get it just right, just right. This is the part that's going to be facing the viewer on the diorama. There we see quite a bit of it there in place. Very nice effect. And there's our finished dried part. And next we take this and what we're going to be using is a product called Rustall. This is the only thing that uh, we use here that's uh, not readily available. It's available. It's on the fact sheet where to order it. This is a very simple uh, rusting uh, technique and uh, it's foolproof and it works very very well. You can use it for all kinds of colors. Shows up pretty dark on this light colored vehicle but you can use it on black or dark gray. 
uh, to bring out rust, just any color, it works well. Now here I'm working from the top and I'm working my way down. You'll notice that my model is setting on a grill, uh, a baking pan with a, a grill in it. And you just uh, flow it on and I put the grill there so if uh, any of it does flow down into the pan I can pour it back into the bottle. You don't have to throw it out, you can put it right back in the bottle again. But I work with a, a small soft brush, a very soft brush, not a hard brush, but a very soft brush. And I just keep working at it and just adding just the amount that I want. What's really nice about this product is it being a liquid, it pools up. You can see right there at the bottom of the door by the running board that it's actually pooled up in that area there, right where uh, rust and moisture would come about because of the water pooling up there naturally. So this just automatically, by definition, finds those areas in the model that uh, would automatically be rusted. That's a foolproof type of thing. Highly recommended. Just continuing to brush it on and put one coat on and you can sit back and let it dry. I always recommend letting things dry. When I work on things like this, I uh, it all points along in my weathering. I always let them dry completely. One, so that they don't bleed into the next coat, but so that I can also look at the model and evaluate just how much I want to do. So just covering the whole thing with this, and that's how it looks with just a first coat. Now, for the purpose of the demonstration here, I'm going back and I'm adding a second coat again. And you can see as it flows down the side there, it just pools in those areas where rust would build up. This would make for a very rusty finish. The type thing that some farmer might have had his car, his 36 Ford, die, and rather than getting rid of it or cutting it up for parts or selling it, he just pushed it out behind the barn, figuring that someday he'd get around to fixing it. And as often happens, never happens. So that car's probably been sitting out there since mid 40s. Probably sitting out there just rusting for 60 years, letting the rain and the, the heat just take its toll on it. So again, we want to cover it all completely. Even on the second coat, we want to make sure we get it all covered completely. And flow it on enough that it really pools up in the areas you want it to be. So that's how it's going to look after we get our second full coat on there. Quite rusty, quite old. And again, we want to let this dry very well. You can see the pock marks there where the, the paint is blistered on the side. It's just an old rusted out hulk. Not much value to anybody anymore. There's a picture of the, the deck area. Close up of the, the model and just rotating it around so you can see it from all the different sides here. Again, this is a very simple, very effective way of getting rust. It's not just for cars. You can use it for rolling stock, uh, anything that you want to have rust. Now we're going to go to work on corrugated siding. Most of us are very familiar with the corrugated siding material that Campbell sells. They've been selling it for 30, 40 years, and it's a very nice product, very easy to use. But it's hard to cut evenly. If you cut it with scissors, it curls. So if you go to Walmart in the fabric department, you'll find this is a little disc cutter. It's a brand name is Friskers. And you just lay it on this cutting board and just roll this sharp edge right across, and it cuts it very smoothly. The board has uh, inch lines on it, so it's very easy to get them all the right size and very easy to get them all straight because it has vertical lines running across it. Now, if I were going to use this for a model, I'd be more careful than doing it that way. I would uh, put a straight edge by it, but for the purpose of the demonstration, this will work fine. Now, I'm taking a piece of cardboard, getting some masking tape, got this one long piece that I'm laying down, putting a piece of tape at one end to hold this down and a tape at the other. That long strip has the sticky side up so that I can just take these pieces and just stick them right on here. Just a light press, 
they stick very well and what we're going to do after we get a couple of rows of this on here well we're going to take it out and we're going to give these a, a coating of paint so we'll do another whole row couple of little pieces longer piece it's best to do this in big batches if you're going to go to the time and the effort to go out cut enough for your entire model here I'm cutting enough just enough uh, to have for this demonstration just sticker pieces on there now for O scale I take these cooking pans that you buy at uh, the grocery store this is some corrugated siding material from Evergreen. It's plastic. It's .080 spacing on this. And in order to make corrugated siding, what we do is we just lay this heavy stuff from these cooking pans right on there. We take a, a ballpoint pen and we run it across just like that, back and forth. Don't do it from one side to the other. Do it in one direction like this, and then the other direction. If you do them all from top to bottom, for example, it'll cause this to curve to the right. So in order for it to stay straight, just do it like this. Very easy way to crank out O-scale corrugated siding. Very economical. This is very strong. Now if you want to crank out a bunch, a bunch you can use ordinary aluminum foil from the kitchen. Here what I've done, I've taken another piece of that same corrugated siding and I've glued it onto this roll of tape. And what I can do then is I can just take a piece of ordinary kitchen aluminum foil, lay it down, and just roll over it with this section on the tape and I end up with very quick, very good corrugated siding very thin very easily damaged but sometimes that looks good you know uh, a lot of times in real life uh, corrugated siding was uh, mistreated and hammered into shape and things like that and it actually looks good with that type of thing now here I'm just using some um, enamel paint this is a ruddy brown primer any kind of reddish primer will work great actually this one is a gray primer and that's what I start with I just spray them a very light gray if you have an airbrush, you'll want to use something like Floquil's SP Light Gray. That's a very popular color. But just finding a light gray at Walmart or uh, Ace Hardware works fine. And you can leave it that light gray, which is the way modern siding looks. But old siding was not galvanized. It was just raw steel and iron, and it rusted severely. So here I'm taking some ruddy brown primer just getting it going here and I just want to spray light coats on here not a lot but see I'm just putting a mist coat over some of it then I'll go back with a, a different color and add slightly different I'm using that terracotta I used earlier just getting the two on there lightly not trying to cover it completely uh, just so that when we pull these individual pieces out and use them uh, they'll look good now one thing I like to do is I've put that primer coat on there and I've let it set for a day or so to, to dry and to get hard. Now I'm just taking some testers paints. Here's a very light gray. I'm dipping it right into the cap of some uh, roof brown and right in with some rust color and blending them right there in the cap. And then I'm not painting this solid color, but I'm just brushing small amounts onto here just trying to get different color variations on those sheets. Those sheets, as they rusted in real life, they didn't rust in a uniform manner. Uh, they rusted uh, with a lot of variation. So just add more color and less color and end up with a bunch of variations in your colors. We're not trying for anything specific here. Just trying to give an overall effect. Rust is different. Everybody has a different idea about what it, rust looks like. And even on the same building and same batches of corrugated material, you'll see on a roof, you'll see a lot of different colors sometimes. You don't want to end up with a checkered board pattern on your roof, but uh, you do want color variation in your different pieces.
It really adds a very nice effect to it. Just continuing on, brushing a few others. You can see I'm not putting really heavy coats on any of this, just very light coats. It's important when you're weathering or doing any painting on your models that you keep your colors very light in color. If they're very dark, they won't show up. It's not like outdoors where you got bright sunlight. It just doesn't show up well. Now here's a model I built about 20 years ago using that technique. Now here's another technique. Now with this, you have to be very careful. If you have children, you want to make sure you keep this out of the way. This is Archer Etchant. That's the brand, Archer, and it's Etchant. It's used for printed circuit boards, and I get it at Radio Shack. And one bottle will last you a lifetime. And I've got a little plastic drawer out of one of those uh, parts bins, and I've labeled it for Etchant, because that's the only thing I ever use this for, is for this. I've got a cup of water handy. I'm going to pour the etchant in to the tray. Don't need an awful lot. Uh, about a quarter of an inch deep is all you need. And you just take your pieces and you just drop them right in. That's the painted side, and I'm putting it the non painted side down. And I'm just going to poke them down into this fluid. Now I've used this fluid a lot before and I'll tell you a little bit about the characteristics. First off, it makes a big mess and it splatters everywhere. So you want to make sure that you're wearing protective eye goggles. Can you see those stains off to the side of that? That's where as the acid works, it, it splatters this stuff around and you certainly don't want it in your eyes. I lay out newspapers and paper towels when I'm working on this. And the way to work with this is to actually take two pieces of this or three pieces of your siding material and put it in this stuff and go away for 30 minutes and come back. It's very slow working when you first start using it, but it speeds up as time goes on. So you want to let it uh, just completely eat away about three pieces of this to start with. Then you come back and you're going to find your etchant is, is black in color. Again, you just want to put the pieces in there. Keep your water handy. What we're going to do, as these start having a chemical reaction, and it takes time, just have to be very patient with this. Uh, if you just put it straight into the etching, it takes 15 to 20 minutes to work. But here it's working quicker. And as you look at that piece closest to the, the bottom of the screen there, you can see that it's starting to bubble and everything. And that's what we're wanting. We're wanting this action right here. When it starts doing that, that's the time to have your tweezers handy. And be very careful with it, but also pull it out and just watch how the action works. You don't want this stuff to disappear completely. Once it starts this process, it can easily just vaporize on you. When it has progressed to a certain amount, you just take it and drop it into the water. Uh, after it's been in the water a while and you take it out to look at it, you can see if you need to drop it back into the, the acid a little more. Uh, just depends upon how much you want to do. And there's the water. I mean, you can see the pieces in there and that water just gets dirty. When you go to dump this stuff out, don't dump it down your kitchen sink and don't throw it outside. I flush it down the toilet, down a ceramic toilet, uh, because this will discolor your uh, the metal around inside your sink and you don't want that. There you can see the holes that have been eaten all the way through this material. This is just a wonderful effect and you get this whether it's painted or not. Uh, this is you don't really have to have it painted but the the painting a lot of people like to do that. If you leave it in there too long uh, the the acid eats through the metal to the point that all you have is a piece of paint. So when you pick it up, that's all you've got is a piece of paint. I generally leave three or four pieces in here at a time. After you've dunked it in water like I've done there, and you look at it and you see if it needs a little more uh, etching, what you can always do is just take that corner and stick it back down into the acid again and work on it. And it doesn't make any difference what kind of aluminum foil you're using. Now, uh, Campbell's it works more slowly than with ordinary aluminum foil. I don't know why, but ordinary aluminum foil it works much more quickly with, and you have to be more careful. So just pick up each piece and evaluate it, 
see how it looks, dunk it in the water, and if you need to stick it back in again, stick it back in. You can put like a corner in, like there, and cause it to eat right at that corner, and cause that corner to just disappear. Doesn't take very long for this to, to work. Very easily done. And it's just a great effect. I don't know of any other way you can possibly get this effect with corrugated siding. Now, like I say, modern corrugated siding is a gray color. It takes paint very well. It's treated so it doesn't rust out like this. But way back when they were using iron, uh, this stuff rusted out really severely. And again, on any one building, you'd see different variations of the amount of rust. You can tell that one was thin that I just pulled out. Now here's some pieces that have been washed and set out to dry. This one, it's almost gone. This one, almost gone. You can take, after these are done, now here's one that was painted. You can also take any of these that you want and with a very soft brush and very small amount of paint, you can go back over with some of your rust colors uh, and and make them rust or you can leave them black like this but I generally go back over with just a little tiny bit more of paint a lot of variety here out of this one batch when you put them on the structure a roof of a structure you want to put them on in such a way that uh, you can tell the difference here's a little building I built built many years ago uh, I've always liked it uh, just like the effect of uh, using this stuff Again, it's very dangerous, very caustic. Be sure to throw away your paper and everything. Clean out your things very well with lots of running water. Wear protective glasses. Wash your hands thoroughly after using this stuff. It is, it is a nasty, nasty type of acid designed for etching printed circuit boards. And it is really rough stuff if you get it in your eyes.